This is Your Morning Basket, where we help you bring truth, goodness, and beauty to your homeschool day. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 32 of the Your Morning Basket podcast. I'm Pam Barnhill, your host, and I am so happy that you are joining me here today. Well, I must say one of my absolutely most favorite things about doing the podcast is getting to learn new things myself. I just love that I get to pick the topic and I get to pick the person and I get to have the discussion. So I was super excited to get to have Matt Bianco on. I've spoke to him a few times and I've heard him speak a few times and I've just always been really impressed with his style of teaching and what he has to say. So we had him on to talk about Socratic discussion today. This is something that I know I have wondered about often. I'm not Socrates, so how in the world am I supposed to do this in my home with my kids? And so I think Matt really went a long way towards answering some of those questions for me today and putting me a little more at ease. This is a skill I can develop with a little bit of practice, and I hope it does the same for you. We'll get on with the podcast right after this word from our sponsor. Would you like to bring classical music into your children's lives? Add classical music to your morning time today with Maestro Classics. We have a special coupon code just for your Morning Basket listeners. Use the code PAM at maestroclassics.com to get 17% off even sales prices. These award-winning CDs and MP3s feature storytellers Yadu and Jim Weiss, accompanied by the world-famous London Philharmonic Orchestra. They perform dozens of titles like Peter and the Wolf, The Nutcracker, and The Story of Swan Lake. What makes Maestro Classic CDs so special is that each one contains an activity book for your children. You can also download free curriculum guides that combine classical music with science, math, geography, and more. All sets include tracks which explain how the music was made, the history and stories behind the music, information about the instruments, and how to practice the learned art of listening. These recordings were specifically designed to develop listening skills in your children. Visit maestroclassics.com for free shipping on all CDs and also MP3s. They start at just $9.98. As a YMB listener, you can receive 17% off your order by using coupon code PAM at checkout. Go to www.maestroclassics.com. That's maestro, spelled M-A-E-S-T-R-O, classics.com, where the best classical music curriculum awaits your homeschool. Matt Bianco is a homeschooling father of three and the director of the Lost Tools of Writing for the Searcy Institute. He is also a mentor in the Searcy Apprenticeship Program. Matt loves talking with kids about philosophy, great literature, and big ideas. And he joins us today to share about ways to incorporate Socratic discussion into morning time. Matt, welcome to the program. Thank you. We are so happy to have you. And I want you to start out by telling us a little bit about we say Socratic discussion. So who are we talking about? Who was Socrates? The tough part of that question is some people would say we don't know. He was a character that lived 400 years before Christ and was apparently the mentor of Plato, who himself eventually mentored Aristotle. And then Aristotle was the mentor, the the teacher of Alexander the Great. Socrates himself never wrote anything. Plato never really wrote anything except for his dialogues and a handful of letters. And so the only thing we really know about Socrates is, however, he was represented in the dialogues that Plato wrote down. So we basically have this image of Socrates that comes to us through Plato, and that's the Socrates we know. So whenever we refer to Socrates, we're typically referring to that person, however accurate or inaccurate it may be to whoever the actual historical Socrates was. We don't really know that part, but it doesn't really matter in the long run because he's a philosopher or we just go by what we know uh, through this representation, right? So he's the philosopher that engaged people with in conversation, question and answers in order to try to discover the truth. And And in the process, he mentored Plato a long way. 
And I was going to say, he obviously made a really huge impact on Plato because, you know, he, Plato goes on to write about Socrates and talk about this method of discussion that we're going to be talking about tonight and record that. Right, right. Because Plato, he, I mean, writes these dialogues following this form that Socrates, had, you know, that he had learned from Socrates. And Plato is not even the only one who wrote Socratic dialogues with Socrates as the main character. There were others, at least one other, that did so as well. So he had an impact, enough of an impact that we do know historically that the city of Athens eventually had him put to death for, well, for irritating them. <laughs> Okay, officially they put him to death for kind of corrupting their youth, but we don't think that that's what he was actually doing. He was really kind of getting under their skin with other things. Yes, yes, officially, right. <laughs> officially because he was corrupting the youth and teaching false gods about false gods, right? Right. Okay, so let's get into this whole discussion technique. So obviously we're not looking to corrupt youth, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's a really great discussion technique. And we know that because Plato wrote about it and because, you know, it was used for centuries after Socrates as a method of education. So talk to me a little bit about what is Socratic discussion. And when we use the term today, are we just talking about the kind of exchanges that Socrates had with others as represented in these dialogues? Or has it come to mean something a bit different? Yeah, good. That's a good question because it has. So for Socrates, a Socratic dialogue was with another character. Typically, scholars refer to that person as the interlocutor in general. They just refer to this other person as the interlocutor. But the interlocutor would be a specific person. So in the Gorgias dialogue, it would be Gorgias. In the Mino dialogue, it was Mino. So he would he would have a one on one conversation with this person, but it was it almost always, with a few exceptions, it almost always took place in somebody's home or in a public setting where there were multiple other people witnessing the dialogue. And sometimes those witnesses or those the audience members would get really excited about what was being discussed, and often in a negative way, they would get angry that the interlocutor wasn't standing his ground against Socrates. And so sometimes these guys would jump in to the conversation and take it over. And what you notice in those instances is that Socrates would typically stop talking to the original interlocutor and start talking to the new person who had interrupted them. And then it would become a one-on-one -on -one conversation with that person. And then he would carry on that conversation as long as he could until he finished it or whatever, sometimes until a new person interrupted. And then he would eventually go back to the original character. So like in the Republic, for example, he starts out with one guy whose name escapes me at the moment, but it's an, it's an elderly man, the guy whose house they're in. And then this fellow by the name of Thrasymachus jumps in, interrupts, the old man leaves, excuses himself and leaves. Thrasymachus jumps in and takes over the conversation because he's frustrated at the responses that Socrates has been getting. And at the end of book one of the Republic, Thrasymachus is done. And then Glaucon steps up and says, well, wait a minute, we have more questions. He carries on a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Glaucon. And then Glaucon's brother, Adamantus, and Glaucon and Adamantus are both actually brothers to Plato. So that's kind of interesting footnote. But Adamantus then interrupts Glaucon. So then he has a one-on-one -on -one with Adamantus. And then he finishes with Adamantus, goes back to Glaucon. And he just kind of continues like that through the whole Republic. And a lot of the dialogues are like that. Now, do you, so think, do you think that's a literary technique on the part of Plato as opposed to an actual historical reckoning of what happened? Or is you know, it, yeah, it could be a literary technique. It, it, I mean, it, to me, it makes sense that it would also be the historical way it unfolded as far as people interrupting because, well, that's what we do, right? <laughs> <laughs> we tend to interrupt each other. So it makes sense to me that people would, in fact, interrupt. And it may be that Plato was using that kind of known characteristic to be able to introduce these other points along the way. But I do think it's important to Plato that Socrates always kind of limited the conversation to that one person. In one regard, it's Socrates is showing great respect to that person by by focusing his attention on that person, you know, for the duration of that aspect of the conversation. But in another sense, it helps 
Socrates to maintain the thread that is being her him that's being woven through the whole conversation. Whereas if the conversation had three, four, five, six, seven people all jumping in and out of it at once or, you know, pulling in and out as that at will, that thread could get lost. And Socrates does what I would say are amazing feats of memory, being able to keep that thread, even with, you know, focusing on one person at a time because of the interruptions, his ability to go down these rabbit trails and then come back to the main point without losing his train of thought is just, it's an incredible feat of memory to me. Okay, so originally Socratic discussion was Socrates having these conversations with basically one person. Now, the person would change, but for the most part, he was carrying this on with one person. So how has this changed into what we're kind of using as, I guess, portraying as Socratic discussion in more classical education circles and homeschooling circles today? Yeah, right. Because typically what you find now in a Socratic conversation is a group of people kind of discussing a point, whether it's a particular issue or question from literature or philosophy, scripture, whatever it is, you know, some idea is raised, a question is raised, and then there's a conversation about it, usually in a group. So, you know, people do it in kind of like a book club format, right? A bunch of moms or moms and dads or whatever will get together discuss it. In a homeschool setting, you might have a group of your kids around or a group of neighbor kids all coming together and doing it. In that situation, what you typically find then is is you find the conversation kind of moving back and forth between the, the entire group of people, you know, four, five, six, seven people. Where So whereas Socrates would have limited it to, you know, one person at a time, we tend to do it in more of a group setting. And we still call that the Socratic conversation or Socratic teaching or the Socratic mode or method or something. And so the focus there then is not so much on the number of people engaged, but the emphasis is on the use of questions and that it's focused on an investigation. So kind of pulling out that particular emphasis from the Socratic dialogue and then making that the emphasis of this way of teaching in a group setting. Okay, that's a great distinction, and it really leads well into kind of my next set of questions. So we've changed the way, you know, historically, Socratic discussion was this one way, Socrates and one other person. And so now we've moved into these kind of Socratic circles or groups in Socratic discussion. So that's definitely changed. But let's talk about the aim of a Socratic discussion. So why would we get a group of people together and try to do this? Are we trying to expose errors in our students' thinking and guide them toward a specific truth the way that Socrates did in the dialogues? Are we trying to do something else? Yeah, that's a good question because for some people, it would depend on how you and how they're interpreting Socrates himself and what he did, that they would look at it in different ways. The way I look at it, and it's it's really it's the way I look at um, Socrates himself doing it, is I think of it as, you know, we're coming together and a question gets raised, some idea gets raised, and we are looking together, we are trying to discover truth. We're trying to discover what is the right way of understanding this, or what is the right way to articulate our understanding of it even? What are the words that we even use to describe it? And what often happens along the way is, as we're describing it, the people in the group, in the discussion, disagree either on the the answer itself or on how to articulate the answer. And the conversation then becomes, so it can feel like it's become about, we've discovered error, now we're going to correct it, which in some cases that is what's happening. But often what you end up having is two people or however many people in the group refining their understanding of it. So for example, I practice this a lot with in my family and and with with just anybody who who's willing, I guess. And it's interesting, like with my oldest son, who's off to college now, when he comes home and he's on break or whatever, we'll have these kinds of conversations about anything. And we we've had them about you know things as important as you know trying to answer the question what is virtue or what is justice to something as you know silly or menial as you know whether people should sunbathe. 
And what's interesting is that when we begin the conversation, we both feel like we're on op- polar opposite sides of the conversation and we're in complete disagreement. And when we finish, we're in agreement with each other, but both of us feel like we won. So I'll end the conversation thinking, ha ha, he came around to my point of view. I won. But if you asked him, he would say the exact same thing. Dad came around to my side of my point of view. I won. And what we both have realized just in pointing this out to each other and thinking through it is that along the way, like we've both been making these kind of minor changes to our understanding, to our articulations that have brought us both to this middle point where both of us have changed or tweak our view or understanding of it, or again, just the way we're articulating it. And now we're on common ground, but we both still feel like we're pretty close to where we were originally too at the same time. So it's, uh, I think what it turns out to be in the end is this journey that everybody involved goes on to get to the truth. But along the way, it feels like we're fighting error, we're, we're correcting things, we're, we're winning wars, you know, we're winning these battles with each other mentally. Okay, so this brings to mind a few other questions. Do you ever come out of one of these discussions feeling like you haven't won? Only when they don't, when they, when they refuse to agree with me. (laughs) 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 Um, (laughs) I don't. Okay, so we're going back to Socrates and the rhetoric and corrupting the youth and. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I guess so. That brings like, is there a right answer? in these discussions that you're having? You say that you're seeking truth. So, well, it's difficult because, you know, there are certain things that the truth factor is really quantifiable and and easy. Like two plus two is four. That's not up for dispute. Typically, I can say that I know two plus two equals four and feel pretty confident that I'm not going to be talked out of that particular view, right? Or I can say, you know, that wall is white. If it's white, then, you know, and feel pretty confident about it. Although, you know, somebody might come along and say, well, actually it's eggshell. But, you know, you know, I can I can feel pretty confident about my guesses or I mean about my perceptions in that way. But then when it comes to something like what is justice, what is virtue, you know, what is what is truth, it's not that those things are unknowable. Like, I firmly believe that we can know and understand those things, but it, it's difficult to pin them down in a precise proclamation or definite, like a dictionary definition. So what happens there is like, you know, I can see something that's true and know it, but I can't always define truth in precise language. Mm-hmm. And so, so the, sometimes when we're having these conversations about virtue or justice or, or whatever, it feels like we're much farther off than we are. And it's, but it's because the, to put it into a proposition is so difficult. And as soon as you put something like justice into a proposition, somebody can name a hundred X, X, a uh, uh, hundred, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for exceptions. here? Yeah, it, exactly. And then it's like, okay, well, are those merely exceptions or do they actually disprove the rule, you know? And it allows for a lot of flexibility in the conversation, which none of that is to say that, you know, those things are unknowable or they're they're relative in any way, but that, well, to borrow the language of Paul there, you know, we see through a glass darkly. So it's a little bit tougher to wrap around. So sometimes, sometimes the fight feels more violent than it is, I guess. So I think what I hear you saying is that the aim of this Socratic discussion is in the journey and not necessarily in the destination. Yes. So in one of my favorite books, Norms and Nobility by David Hicks, my favorite books on education, he talks about this in, he's talking about the dialectic and he talks about this idea that like with some of these, I guess I will call them abstract truths for this conversation, I guess, that these ideas like you feel like you can see them, but it's like they're constantly receding away from you. Like a, like if you're driving across Kansas or whatever out west toward the Rockies, and you can see the mountains in the far, far distance. You can see them. You feel like you know I get it. I've got what's there, but you keep driving and driving and driving and driving, and they don't feel like they're getting any closer for a long time, right? And then all of a sudden, boom, they're right there. It's kind of like that where the where 
it's like you're trying to wrap your arms around it and it just, you know, wisps away like a ghost or something like the wind. But it's there. Like, you know, it's there. You feel it. You've got it. You understand it. But then it's constantly pulling away. And so you're still driving, still driving, still driving, still driving. So the whole thing becomes about all of us are pursuing truth. And but all of us feel like going into the conversation, we often feel like, oh, I know what the answer to this question is. Mm -hmm. And yet it still turns out to be a journey for each of us. So like even like this is why I, I, I think why I interpret Socrates the way I do. Like some people would say Socrates knew the answer to every question he asked. And he was going into the conversation with the intent of correcting this person's error. And I would agree, it certainly feels like Socrates knows what he's getting at or what he thinks. But then so do I every time I do it. And yet every time my answer changes by the end. So I don't know. Hmm. Okay, so let's kind of pull this down a little bit and make this practical for or sort of practical for the just the general homeschool mom. So I'm thinking about this. What would be the I want to help my students, my children come to truth. I want to help them maybe wrestle with some of these questions. So what are some questions that we might wrestle with in our homeschool in this Socratic fashion? Could you give me a few examples? You've given me a couple, but could you give me a few more, maybe from literature or from science or from math? Yeah, yeah. Uh, good. So to me, one of the most important questions that we can ask in the dialogue, you know, doing Socratic teaching is to compare. So the two that are, are probably the easiest to think about would be definition, like define the term, whatever it is we're discussing. And then the second thing would be to compare. So say, for example, we wanted to figure out, you know, what is a hero? Then then we just start naming characters that our immediate gut reaction, our immediate feeling is, oh, yeah, that guy's a hero. But I can't define hero. I can't put it into a proposition. And if I do, what I find is that I often end up giving a definition that excludes people that I would normally consider heroes. So like, for example, I would say Bilbo Baggins is a hero. But if I asked a group of high school students or junior high students, what is a hero? They're probably going to name something or describe something that sounds a little bit more like, you know, Superman or Batman or something, somebody who's strong and powerful and, you know, always wins and always gets the bad guy and, you know, wins the prize, something like that. But then Bilbo, of course, doesn't describe that because he's not big and strong and, you know, full of superpowers and, uh, well, except till he gets that ring. But, <laughs> you know, what I mean, and so the very definition then excludes a particular character that they would probably say is a hero. So often what you can do is you can have them name like two or three or four people that they would say, this guy's a hero, this person's a hero, and then start comparing them. Well, what do they all have in common? You know, what do they share? What do they do? What do they have? What are they? And look for those similarities and differences. And then from that, draw out a definition for hero. Or with justice, you can, you know, name a couple of actions that you would that they would consider, yeah, that's just to do that would be to do justice and then name two or three or four of those kinds of activities and compare them. And what makes, why are these all just, what do they all share in common that, that is that common thread that we're identifying as justice. So comparison to me is, is an incredible tool for Socratic teaching. Okay. Do you add another example for me? Maybe, uh, maybe something outside of literature, we could even go to history or. Yeah. So, well, it would probably be too similar to the literature example, but I remember actually having a conversation with a group of students once where they were trying to, they were trying to define what is a leader. And they did that. Somebody gave a kind of dictionary definition for leader. And then the other students were like, well, but so-and-so wouldn't meet that definition. So then we just listed everybody that they could think of off the top of our heads as leaders and then put them in. And then they just started talk, kind of separating them as like, these are the guys that are, these are good guys who are leaders. These are bad guys who are leaders. And then trying to make a, a definition that way and trying to, trying to decide, is there, is there a definition for leader that includes both or is leader only for good people? And then there's a different word for bad people. But that's very similar to the literature example, except it just took characters from history. So like they, you know, Prince Henry, the navigator, Richard Nixon, you know, Hitler was on the list, the bad guy list, obviously. But so there's that kind of example. But even if you were trying to get them to 
take like a, a mathematical concept. If you were trying to get them to divide fractions, then you can walk them through the process of dividing fractions multiple times. So you put on the board, you know, one half divided by three quarters and then solve it. And then right next to it, two thirds divided by one third and then solve it. And then three halves divided by one fourth and then solve it. And then have them look at those three examples and compare. What did we do the same both times? What did we, what did we do first? What did we do next? What did we do after that? What did we not do every time? And then, and then through that comparison, they can discover the truth. In this case, the truth is the truth of how to solve, how to divide fractions would be the truth they were seeking. But they do that. They see those three examples and compare them. And then they discover the truth in that process. Instead of me just saying step one, step two, step three, step four, instead of me telling them the truth, I have them do the comparison and they discover it. Okay, that's awesome. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about comparing. Is there, I don't know, I'm I'm trying to get my verbiage correct. I don't know if that's a technique or a kind of question. Is there another kind that you might use other than comparing in Socratic discussion? What's something else you could do to help students arrive at the truth? Yeah, the, you know, one of the other things, I guess the other thing, the first one that would pop into my head is to have them look at circumstances. If, if you're talking about events, typically, like in literature or history uh, or even like Bible stories or whatever, you know, have them look at events because, you know, so so I guess an easy example would be, you know, the Bible says in the Ten Commandments, the Bible says thou shalt not kill, which we understand to mean thou shalt not murder. And so, so you know, you have people killing in war, you have people killing, you know, to punish murderers, and then you have people murdering the you know, people that they shouldn't be killing. And the difference between killing and murder is the circumstance. You know, what's going on here? What's different about these two situations that makes one killing and one murder? So, so often when you're, are trying to find the truth and you're looking at a particular situation or you're comparing two separate situations, often it's the differences that kind of, that might show, oh, this is why I'm on the wrong. This is why I'm not drawing the right conclusion about truth, the right truth about, you know, in this, in this question is because I, I ignored a particular set of circumstances. So, you know, in this situation, the guy, the guy was, you know, a murderer and when he got, when he was put to death, but in this other situation, he was, you know, the good King when he was put to death. So one is killing, one is murder kind of thing. So circumstances can help. And the other thing with circumstances is that it, it helps you to see what's going on, you know, at that time, but also what's going on around it. Like, so yeah, this, you know, this particular situation is happening here in Italy, but what's going on in France at that time, what's going on in England at that time. And sometimes bringing in those details can help us to understand why a particular thing might be happening or why particular characters or people are feeling the way they are because they're feeling what's going on elsewhere as well. Okay, so comparing and looking at circumstances would be two kinds of Socratic methods we could use in talking about, because this is me, this is one of the things that I struggle with most is, yeah, you know, how to learn how to begin these Socratic discussions. And so kind of let's get into some of the nitty gritty of that. What ages are the best for Socratic discussion? You know, our listeners, they have families, they have young kids, they have older kids, you know, it's kind of a wide age range. Can it work with a range of ages like we might find in morning time? Right, right. So I think so. One of the ways, I I think there are a couple of things that you can do to help make it work or to see it work. You know, in, in one regard, if you're doing, if you're reading the story out loud during morning time, and then if you're also practicing, practicing narration or something like that, then you can have, you know, you can have some of the kids narrate what was read back. So often, like even with high school age kids, I would have, you know, they, they would, and cause I'm meeting in a co-op when I'm teaching in, in this age. And so the kids read the story at home. We didn't read it in, you know, we're not reading it during our meeting time. And so then they come in. And so then I just ask them to summarize what they read 
and a couple, you know, I'll have a couple of different students do that, or I'll have them, or I'll, I'll ask, you know, is there anything you would add, any important details that, you know, this you think might be left out or that would be important to the conversation or whatever. So there's a kind of, you know, well after the fact, but a kind of narration going on there. I think in morning time, you could do a similar thing where you have the, you know, you have some of the children narrate back and then off that narration, you can build, you can take the Socratic conversation. In some cases you can have, and and with a story, the easiest Socratic conversation is to ask, you know, whether the character should have done what he did. And then, you know, you're, you kind of get into an ethics, I guess, a, a, an, eth- an ethical study, but you're teaching the students how to, or their children, how to pass judgment. And they're passing, they're learning how to judge a situation that they're not necessarily personally invested in. Mm-hmm. Right. If I ask my son, you know, to tell me whether he should play the Xbox till two in the morning, he's going to have a dog in that fight, right? He's, he has a certain outcome that he wants to achieve. <laughs> in convincing me to believe, to think a certain way about it. But if I ask him to, you know, tell me whether, you know, whether Brutus should have killed Julius Caesar, then he's not necessarily invested in that in the same way. So he's willing to investigate it more honestly. So one of the things you can do is, you know, if you do your, your morning, your reading out loud during morning, uh, do a narration or not, if, if depending, you know, if you do, if you practice that or not, and then just identify that question, that behavior to ask about, but even, even with little kids like Debbie Harris, Deb Harris gave a talk at, the, at one of the Searcy regional conferences in, in Chicago a few years ago. And she talked about reading fairy tales to her students. And she's got kindergartners, like five-year-olds. And she would stop in the middle of the fairy tale and say, well, what do you think you're going to do next? Mm-hmm. And it would be a situation where the, the character was about to decide whether to tell the truth or not. And so she would and say, do you think, what do you think? And then ask the kids, is he a liar? Is he going to tell the truth? And the kids would, and the kids would say, and she'd have, you know, all of them or several of them do it. And so in a sense, like even those, those little kids, five-year-olds are starting. And when they answer that question, they are starting to judge that situation. Like, you know, they're trying to, they're, they're looking at the circumstances and say, well, he's probably going to lie because of this. Like she, she tells the story actually in one case where the character was asked, three times in a row, the same question. It was about an ax, whether this ax is his or not. And it was three different axes. And the first ax was made of pure gold. The next one was made of pure silver. And the next one was studded with gems. And so after, so before the first one, she said, what do you think he's going to say? And some of the kids said he's going to lie. And some of the kids said he's going to tell the truth. And then he tells the truth. So then she, then after the second ask, or with the second ax, she asks again. And so now more of the kids thought he would tell the truth this time because he did the last time. And then with the third act, she asked him again. And this time, more of the kids thought he was going to lie than both of the first two times. And so she asked him why. And they said, because you can't be, I don't know if these were their exact words, but how she tells the story, because you can't be tempted that many times and not give in. And these are five-year-olds, right? Five-year-olds, so, yeah. Yeah. So the five-year-olds were doing that kind of Socratic conversation, you know, and thinking through the actions and the behaviors of the of the students, like, you know, they're probably not gonna, you know, dig all the way down to what is truth in that story, but they're going to be thinking about those particular embodiments of it, you know, of this all telling the truth, no matter what. And then the the response, you know, the reactions to it from the other characters, but then the older kids might be able to, to dig a little further and talk about why or what truth is there. The little kids are still participating with, you know, their questions that they were asked or with their opportunity to narrate, but also just in the listening. Yeah, very much so. And actually, we've had a couple of moms in here on the show with families with a very wide age range who talk about, you know, being amazed at what the little kids are garnering as they're listening in on the conversations or, you know, they get opportunities for the bigger kids to kind of step up and to mentor and lead the younger kids too. So I think having them there for these conversations is probably a good thing, but I think they'll sometimes surprise you with what they come out with these little guys. Yeah. I'm I'm pretty sure when I listened to Deb Harris's talk, when she told that story about the little kids, I'm pretty sure I got a little knot in my throat at that moment when she talked about the little kids saying, you can't be tempted that many times just to think about how insightful they were in that moment, you know? whatever language they use to describe it, how insightful they were in that moment. And I'm thinking, these are five-year-old kids, you know? 
this is incredible. Human beings are just amazing. (laughs) Very much so. And I love the way the example you gave about your son in the Xbox and how, you know, we're leading them to think through a situation and to put forth an argument for a situation and to come to to make a judgment that, you know, I love the way you said that because I'm this is great. Thirty. It takes me 30 minutes in and I'm finally like, ah, I'm getting really good understanding now. <laughs> Sometimes it takes me a while. But I love the fact that you said he has, you know, he has no dog in that fight. And so he's free to learn how to make these arguments and make a judgment and present evidence for a case and look at both sides because he's doing it. He's practicing on something that he's not as vested in. So. I thought that yeah. was a great example. Thank you. And, you know, it's it's really, it's a process that as you become more experienced with it, you and your family, your children, that you can really begin to trust it, that their ability to think well. So my daughter, she's 16 now, but three or four years ago, my oldest had graduated from high school and we are going to take a family trip to New York City and and she didn't want to go because the girls from church were having, they're doing their own weekend thing that same weekend. And so she wanted to go with them instead of with us. And so I, I'd asked her and she had done, you know, practice this several times. I mean, for, you know, a couple of years at that point. And so I just told her, I said, well, you know, why don't you, you know, work through this and write it up into an essay and then explain to me which side, which decision is the right decision, go to New York with us or, you know, go to, Great Wolf Lodge with your friends and, and they explained to me and, and whatever you decide, whatever you decide, that's what we'll do. And she trusted me because one time I made a deal with her. If she could convince me to get a cat through an essay then I would. And, and she got the cat. So she knew I would follow through on my, my promise. So, so she, she did it and, or she was planning to do it. And then a couple of weeks later, as we were approaching the, the trip, I asked her, you know, when are you going to write that essay and give it to me? And she said, I'm not. And I was like, I thought that she was saying, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm just, I'm just going to not go. And I was like, no, yes, you are. And she's like, no, dad, I don't need to. Because as I was working on it, I realized that I need to go to New York with you guys. And she, you know, she drew that conclusion on her own. And and it was even at that point, it was kind of unsupervised even, right? She went through the whole process in her own mind and then came to that conclusion and then we had, a, you know, a great family trip to New York City. And <laughs> and you didn't have to take, you know, a pouting teenager along. So <laughs> you're exactly right. Right. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have to take a pouting teenager along. She was happily, you know, she went with us happily and willingly. And and she wasn't she wasn't, you know, she was still sad, I think, about missing missing the weekend with her friends from church. But but she wasn't, you know, yeah, bitter about it in any way or frustrated or angry with anybody over it. So it was it was beautiful. Okay, so you're selling us on this. So let's talk about how we can do this in our morning time. So should we be discussing everything we read in morning time? How do we decide what to dig into? What makes a good uh, practice in reasoning for our students? How do I decide what topics to kind of pursue? Yeah, well, you know, so if you're starting it new, like you've never done it before with the kids, it will be weird for them, right? It'll be strange. I had students that I did this with for every subject. I mean, we were all day, you know, we're meeting and we're doing this for every subject except for Latin. Whenever we did Latin, we just, we would just stop and we would translate. And I realized like these poor kids were, were reducing the study of Latin to this like decoding process. They didn't care about what the text was that they were translating. They just cared about, you know, getting it into English. And didn't even care what the English said. So I decided instead of spending a full hour translating the Latin, that we would spend 40 minutes. And then the last, you know, last 15, 20 minutes, we would discuss the content of what had been translated. So if if we were translating a poem, we would discuss what is this poem about? You know, what does it mean? Why is he writing this? Who is he writing to? Whatever. And we just kind of try to do a Socratic conversation about the poem. And for the first six weeks, the kid just stared at me like I was crazy. And these are kids that were doing Socratic conversation with every other subject, but they were so unaccustomed to it with Latin that they just didn't know. And it was about the sixth week or so when when they started discussing, when they actually started having 
you know, input or whatever to, oh yeah, so this is about blah, blah, blah. And then in, over time, I started, I started realizing that their translations were getting better because they, they like, like it was important now to get it right because it was going to affect the conversation. So anyhow, so if it's new, it'll be hard. Don't let that discourage you. Like I just had to like deal with that for six weeks <laughs> of just being stared at like I was crazy. Because in their mind, I was, I mean, I, I was, I was crazy. You don't do this with Latin. You're, you're mixing it all up, Mr. Bianca. So if that happens in, in your morning time, that's okay. Just push through. You don't be afraid of the silence. So, okay. So the, the easiest thing would be to just ask, you know, you, the, the narration is, is a good way, you know, just ask them to summarize what was read or, or discussed or just said, or to ask about a particular action. So anytime a character does something that makes a choice to do or not do something, that almost always becomes a question you can ask. So, you know, Bilbo, if we, if we use The Hobbit, for example, again, Bilbo goes on the adventure. Should Bilbo have gone on the adventure? You know, Bilbo goes and tries to, to burger, burgle the trolls. Should Bilbo have tried to burgle the trolls? The, uh, you know, Bilbo finds the ring and keeps it. Should, should Bilbo have kept the ring? And just, I mean, any action that, that somebody takes, you can ask that question. And then, and the, the question will, I mean, it'll always, it'll always lead to some insight. Of course, you know, we feel better about some insights than others, but so do our students, so do our children. So the particular insight that you might want them to chase down might not be the insight that they end up chasing down, might not be the question they want, they want to ask. Because you want them to be participatory, you want them, like often I just let them ask, like of these actions, of all these things that this guy just did, which of these is you know the most interesting to you or the craziest to you or whatever. And then they pick and then we ask about it that way. And that they're more involved, you know, they're more, they participate more because it's, it's something they're thinking about. And there's still some truth they're going to discover or that there, there's a potential to be discovered. So it's okay that way. And I think it's important to bring up at this point that you don't have to have an answer to the question that you're asking. And so yeah, that, that's a good point. So you, you may, you, I mean, you may not even sometimes, you know, obviously 90% of the time, 99% of the time, there's not going to be a cut and dry answer. You know, you, like you said, it's the journey of getting to this truth and you don't have to be afraid of the fact that you haven't figured out in your mind yet, should Bilbo have taken the ring or burgled the trolls or anything like that, that you can be part of the process of coming to whatever it is your answer is going to be. And then also, they may go off in a different direction and come up with something that you totally never expected them to come up with. You're right. Exactly. In a lesson on Henry V one time, I wanted to talk about courtship because there's a scene with Henry courting the princess from France. And I thought, oh, teenagers want to talk about courtship. Yeah, well, lo and behold, teenagers do not want to talk about courtship <laughs> with Mr. Bianco, especially because Mr. Bianco uses the word courtship. <laughs> so, OK, fine. They didn't want to talk about it with me. But the question that they brought up was about secession. Oh, succession. Succession is the one where somebody replaces you after the after you die when you're near the king, right? Yep, that's keep, the one. Keep getting succession and secession mixed up. Oh, so succession. They wanted to talk about succession because at the end of the play, Henry dies and he has no, I mean, he has an heir, but the heir's too young and nobody has been trained to succeed him. And so England falls into all kinds of chaos because of it. All of the gains that he made as king were lost because the, the advisors that, that ruled the country until his son grew up didn't know what they were doing and they ruined the country. And the students caught that and they were like, and they wanted to talk about that. And, and apply it to all kinds of things like, is the president of the United States responsible to, you know, mold a successor? Is our, our parents responsible to mold their children as kinds of successors? Is a CEO responsible to mold a successor? And they're applying this to all kinds of things that I just, I would never even have occurred to me. And, and in the end, the conversation that they brought to the table was far more important than the one I was going to bring to the table but especially to them because it was participatory for them, or I guess I'll use the word relevant, but some, I like participation better there. But anyways, it was more relevant to them because it was, it was their question. I wasn't trying to answer a question that they hadn't asked because it was, it was the question they had asked. So it, it 
you know, they had room for it in their in their hearts and their minds and their souls, I guess. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about before we close. Sometimes, well, Socrates. Sometimes between him and the other characters, the relationship was a little bit adversarial. He wanted to expose these errors in their thinking. So as homeschool moms or dads and, you know, we're chatting with our students, we're having these discussions, we're wrestling with some of these ideas, we're starting at two different places. How can we do this and make sure that we don't end up in some kind of adversarial conversation (laughs) with our kids? Well, that's good, especially because some of that adversarial nature of it starts coming kind of on its own. So we don't need to exacerbate it, right? In trying to have these conversations. You know, one thing is to listen. So, hey, maybe this is where narration comes up again, right? If like, instead of just narrating what we read, maybe we have to narrate what was said to make sure we're really hearing what the other person is saying. Like probably the most of the time when there's a kind of adversarial feel to the dialogues. It's when the interlocutor isn't really listening to what Socrates is saying. In fact, he'll say something like, have you heard what I, did you hear what I just said? Because, you know, you're asking me to do something that I just told you I don't believe in kind of thing. And, and so there's, there's not the listening aspect of it. So the, probably the main thing that we can do as parents is to stop seeing this as an opportunity to impose you know, my will or my view on them, but to listen to what they're thinking. And, and then the other thing would be, it's okay if they don't believe the right thing. Now that's hard because, right. I'm saying your, your kid might be a heretic and, (laughs) or, you know, completely unethical. And I'm saying it's okay, but it is because, you know, first your kid's nine or 10 or 12 or 14 they're not out running a country or, you know, running a company or running around the neighborhood on their own. They're still there under your protection and kind of living with you. And so they're, they're being allowed to explore these things on their own or under your safety, your protection. And the thing is, they're, they're not, they're only going to come to the right conclusions one of two ways, either by learning these skills, you know, to judge and practicing them until they learn to make right, you know, good judgments, or by simply parroting what you say back to you. You know, the first option is more preferable because then it's theirs. It's really theirs. They own it. They're not just copying you. So let them practice the tools knowing that their judgments are going to be bad for a while. I mean, you know, look, I'm 40 years old and I make bad judgments still. So I'm still learning to do this. The kids are almost certainly going to draw the wrong conclusions. But know that this is not the last conversation you'll ever have on the on the topic either. I'll give you an example. One time I was talking to my daughter about marriage and she's 16. And I think at this point she had just turned 16 or maybe she was about to turn 16. And she's telling me about her views on marriage. And so I was sitting there and I was listening. And then I asked her some questions because I disagreed with her views on marriage. So I asked her some questions and apparently she thought that I was trying to argue with her and try to convince her that she was wrong. And she goes, dad, I'm 16. My views on marriage are going to change between now and the time I get married. It's okay. She's like, I know I'm probably wrong. And I was like, okay. (laughs) So it's like she had figured out, she had figured out, I guess that she's only 16 and she doesn't know what she's talking about, but she's going to, but it's all she's got. So she's going to live with it for now, you know, but knowing that you know, that the opportunity for change will come. And so I think, I think we just, I think we need to be willing to do that and trust that, you know, if we, if this becomes a habit of how we approach life, how we approach the big questions of life, then these questions, these conversations will repeat over and over and over again until, I mean, until even after they're out of the house, like I said, my college son, you know, when he's home on on break, but even sometimes he'll call like in the middle of the week, dad, we need to talk about virtue because I just read a book on I just read this book and this guy said virtue is blah, blah, blah. We need to discuss it. Okay. You know, so as it becomes a habit, you'll have those repeated opportunities. And if we're constantly trying to make them spout off the right answer all the time, then they never actually get to investigate for themselves. And I think that would create that adversarial. That's more likely to create the adversarial you know, situation in the home than you know, these crazy guys Socrates was arguing with. 
Well, and I think it goes back to what you were talking about before with, you know, by practicing this often, they're learning to wrestle with these ideas while they're still under your protection. And so there's just, it's great practice. It's a skill that has to be, you know, we, so often we think about, you know, as somebody a good thinker and we kind of align that with intelligence or something, but really it's a skill that needs to be practiced over and over again. And, uh, you know, by practicing that skill, just like by practicing our handwriting, we become a good thinker like we develop beautiful penmanship. Yes, exactly. Yeah, because judgment is a skill. Thinking is a skill. It's something that has to be practiced and trained. You can't expect a kid to to do it perfectly the first time out, the first time you have a conversation, especially on something like what is justice, what is virtue, what is truth, what is God? I don't know. You know, those are hard questions. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. and, but we want them to have the right answers, but we've got to let them wrestle with it. And just as a side note, like as a kind of a scientific study to kind of back up what I'm saying or what we're saying. Nancy Piercy talks about in her book, in her book, Saving Leonardo, she talks about a study that was done with college students looking at the college students, you know, who entered college as Christians and left there as, well, both, whether they left as Christians or they left as atheists. And in this particular study, the conclusion was the students who grew up in homes where they were allowed to wrestle with questions of faith were the students who went off to college and kept the faith. The students who were never allowed to discuss questions of faith because they always just had to have the right answer. Those kids grew up and went off to college and were more likely to leave the faith. So there's uh, at least one study out there that kind of backs up the, you know, let them practice judging and, and thinking. Right. And it wasn't necessarily that these kids lost their faith because uh, they had never heard anything else or it had all been squished down, but maybe because they'd never been given the opportunity to do that mental exercise and to to come to that, you know, build that skill of right thinking. So. Right. Right. Well, Matt, thank you so very much for coming on here today and helping us get a little bit of understanding about what to me has always been kind of a daunting topic. I really do appreciate you doing that. Is there somewhere I can go if I want to learn more about helping my kids make good judgments? Well, you know, most of the most of the tools that I just described as far as like the questions, definition, comparison, circumstance, a lot of those are tools that are that that Cersei uses in the Lost Tools of Writing. So I just pull those right from the Lost Tools of Writing and use them in my Socratic conversations. So the Lost Tools of Writing I think would be a good a good place. But there's also a book called Socratic Circles. I can't remember the guy's name, Matt. I think his name is Matt something. And he he wrote a book called Socratic Circles, and he describes how to do it in a classroom with like, you know, if you have like 12 or 15 kids, how to do it with literature there. And he talks about the how to do it as far as like kinds of questions or things to put out there, but then also how to like organize the students so it's a little more orderly when you're having a group participate all at once instead of one-on-one. So there's probably some good tips there. I have not read that book in probably six or seven years. But it seems it seems like it was a book that I thought was pretty helpful at the time. So, OK, well, we will link to Lost Tools in the show notes and we'll also look up that book and link to that Socratic Circles book as well. So people can go if we've piqued their interest a little bit, they can go and find more information. So thanks very much, Matt. Thank you. That's a lot of fun. I appreciate it. And there you have it. Now, if you would like links to any of the books or resources that Matt and I spoke about today, you can find those on the show notes for this episode of the podcast. That is at pambarnhill.com forward slash YMB32. We'll have everything that you need right over there, including a link to the Maestro Classics website where you can use the coupon code PAM to get 17% off your order. Now I'll be back again in a couple of weeks with another great morning time interview. Until then, keep seeking truth, goodness, and beauty in your homeschool day.